From the earliest chronicles of British history, over a thousand years ago, telling of the constant menace of Viking raids, the history of Britain has been a story of an island nation and its relationship with the sea. The great transformation of her naval strength began in 1509, when my ancestor, an 18-year-old Henry VIII, ascended the throne and energetically assumed the task of creating a navy that could challenge the best of the French and Spanish warships. From being a source of vulnerability over many centuries, the sea would eventually become Shakespeare's moat defensive. And the reign of Henry's daughter, the extraordinary Elizabeth I, would see the development of a faster, more lethal fleet that would eventually engage an enemy in a great sea battle that marked the moment at which England established itself as a potential world power. Surrounded by water, Great Britain's fate has always been tied to the sea. And because of her magnificent navy, this small island nation rose from European obscurity to rule the mightiest empire the world has ever seen, encompassing fully one quarter of the Earth's surface. But the sea has also carried her gravest threats, the war galleons of the mighty Spanish Armada, the thundering broadsides of Napoleon's fleet, the powerful gray dreadnoughts of Kaiser Wilhelm, and the swift and deadly wolf packs of Adolf Hitler. For over 500 years, the Royal Navy has been Great Britain's shield and her sword. But Britain's intimate bond with the sea had begun far earlier. Millions of years before the people who came to be known as Britain settled in the British Isles, their fate had been determined by the geological forces that cut off their homeland from the European continent and sculpted its many splendid natural ports and harbors. The English Channel defines England as something other than a European nation. All other European powers have major land frontiers with significant opponents and have to spend a much higher proportion of their budget on fixed and military defences. The absence of a major land frontier is fundamental to the ability of the Navy to keep up a dominant battle fleet. It's the reason why England becomes a great naval power. Between the end of the Middle Ages and the late 17th century, six royal dockyards were established at strategic sites on the English coast. Plymouth in the west, Portsmouth on the south, Woolwich and Deptford on the Thames near London, and Chatham and Sheerness on the Medway. The Royal Navy was born at these ports and honed into a powerful weapon and unique instrument of national will, an extraordinary institution whose example would be imitated by nations around the world who sought glory, honor, and respect on the sea. With the development of naval gunnery, the Royal Navy introduced radical strategic and technological changes in sea warfare a legacy of achievement that would enable England to conquer the world's oceans and protect her shores for well over 500 years. Since the time of the Norman Conquest in 1066, many foreign invaders have tried to storm the shores of Fortress England, but all have failed. Time and again, the Royal Navy and the entities that preceded it were largely responsible for England's continued security. Of all the English harbors, None is more important than Portsmouth. It was here at the beginning of the 16th century that the Royal Navy began to assume an even more vital role in England's national affairs. Portsmouth is a natural place to land when you're crossing the channel. Uh, the Romans landed there, the Normans landed there. You can see their remains at the back end of the harbor. And it then becomes a natural place, first of all, to defend and then from which to project power out into the channel. It's got that natural breakwater of the Isle of Wight in front of it, so the storms can't come right in. It's relatively deep water, a huge anchorage, you can get your whole navy in there. So it becomes the home of the Royal Navy, and it remains that to this day. Some of the most famous warships in history are berthed in Portsmouth, including HMS Victory, Admiral Horatio Nelson's flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, HMS Warrior, the world's first true iron warship built in 1860. And inside a covered dry dock, the preserved remains of the 500-year-old Mary Rose. Built in 1512, during the reign of King Henry VIII, 
Mary Rose quickly joined one of Henry's many wars against England's ancient enemy, France, as the flagship of the English fleet. For over 30 years, she enjoyed the privilege of being the king's favorite. Mary Rose was one of the first of a new breed of warships and is the only existing example of a 16th century fighting vessel. Painstakingly excavated and raised from the bottom of Portsmouth Harbor in 1981, the ship's hull is in remarkably good condition, considering the fact that it spent nearly half a millennium at the bottom of this busy harbor. The thrill about working on something of the Mary Rose is that um, when we were diving every day, something new and exciting would come up. We have over 19,000 objects raised from the Mary Rose, and those vary from a single brick to a gold coin to a pair of shoes, all sorts of different types of material. The Mary Rose has provided so much evidence for understanding the function of things that we can see in paintings or in illustrations, and uh, even identifying them. One of the strange ironies of the Mary Rose is that after 30 years of service in Henry's Navy, the ship rolled over and sank in the heat of a battle with the French fleet a stone's throw from where she was built. To this day, there are still unanswered questions about why the Mary Rose sank. Of much greater importance, however, are the thousands of objects which have been recovered along with much of the ship's hull, yielding a priceless trove of information about this pivotal period in the history of the Royal Navy. Henry VIII is often called the father of the Royal Navy, but he was far from being the first English king to use the ports of England to bring violence to his enemies. The earliest record of a British king organizing a navy was in 885, when King Alfred the Great built a fleet of longships to combat Viking raiders on the Wessex shore. By 1200, English warships had evolved from fragile Viking-style ships into heavy-timbered, deep-draft cogs, as they were called. By the 15th century, cogs had been replaced by the larger and more refined Carrick, though both shared the defining characteristics of warships at the time. They have big, high superstructures. They're like floating castles, and that's undoubtedly the way they thought about them, because that's the very words they used. Forecastle, forecastle, after castle. And so they go into action, running alongside an enemy's ship with these castles crowded with fighting men. They're carrying the same weapons and proposing to fight in the same hand-to-hand -hand battles as they would ashore. Despite the great evolution of naval architecture, the tactics for fighting at sea changed very little for thousands of years. Most sea fighting is almost entirely hand-to-hand -hand fighting. Medieval English ships also had archers, of course, but essentially when they fight another ship, if they do, then they come alongside and fight it out hand-to-hand. -hand. The typical scenario seems to have been that just as you ran alongside, if you had some guns, you fired them off, and they made a colossal bang, which frightened everybody, an enormous cloud of smoke, their main objective is a kind of cover for the boarding party. They board a scramble across in the smoke. They clearly weren't expecting to sink ships with these guns. But as guns got bigger and more lethal, so did the fear of capsizing. The solution to the problem was the watertight gunport lid, which allowed heavy cannon to be mounted lower in a ship where their weight would serve as ballast. Perfected early in the 16th century, one of the first monarchs in Europe to have his warships fitted with the new invention was Henry VIII. Well, the Meros represents probably one of the first attempts to build a purpose-built warship capable of broadside engagement. The actual building of the ship with these gun ports with tight sealing lids is something which is pretty much of a, a revolution because it does allow guns low in the ship. One of the great things about it is a huge number of guns on board, and when one looks at it, that 91 listed guns, 34 of those are big carriage-mounted guns, some of which weigh nearly three tons. Aside from the throne itself, the most valuable of Henry VIII's inheritances were at Portsmouth, a royal dockyard and four large carracks. Using these as the basis of a permanent royal fleet, the young monarch began aggressively building and acquiring more warships. Over the course of his reign, the royal fleet would eventually grow to a total of 58 vessels. When one thinks about Henry VIII at the start of his reign, here is an 18-year-old who was determined to be the early 16th century superstar. Henry VIII genuinely had an affection and uh, also an intuitive desire to build a navy.
He always went on about how good it was to be at sea. He had a golden boatswain's call that he had around his uh, neck every time he went to Portsmouth or went onto the water. So here is a man who actually wants to have a navy as an attribute of kingship. By 1512, Henry VIII's revolutionary new warships had barely been fitted out and made ready for sea when they were plunged into a war against England's ancient enemy, France. In the heat of the battles that lay ahead, Henry's new navy found itself under constant threat to defend Fortress England. These battles would not only change warfare at sea, they would force England to change history. It was here in Greenwich, on the banks of the Thames, that the young King Henry VIII acquired his hunger for glory in combat with his Royal Navy. And it was here that many of the earliest seaborne invaders of England landed. When the first people arrived by boat, it was mud the whole way from the North Sea until you arrived around here, Green Reach, uh, as it became known, Greenwich now, uh, was the first place you could land in a boat uh, if you were a Viking and interested in pitching camp. It overlooked the river and therefore provided an ideal vantage point. But also because of a bend in the river, anything transiting up or down had to slow down to go around the bend as well. So it was identified, as I say, both as a place to camp where you could then move on and attack London or a place where you could then form a, a defence. Today, Greenwich is best known as the home of the prime meridian from which all the world's navigation is measured and is the basis for international time. The heritage of science and exploration is a large part of England's maritime history. Since the time of Henry VIII, many of the leaders of the Royal Navy combined science and revolutionary new naval doctrine within the historical institutions now standing on the site of his palace. The Royal Navy prides itself on remaining uh, at the forefront of technology, of remaining as among the best, if not the best, Navy in the world. It's a tradition of 350 years standing. It's clearly a legacy that one works to protect and uphold when serving in the Royal Navy. For the court of Henry VIII, Greenwich was the first port of call for visiting ambassadors and the center of his naval planning. Within a year after Mary Rose joined the fleet as his flagship, the king had new royal dockyards established nearby at Deptford and Woolwich, so he could keep a close watch on the construction of new ships and the repair and refitting of others. Another advantage of being on the Thames was that ships constructed at these yards were only a short distance from the Tower of London, where all royal warships were fitted with guns. Yet even though Henry VIII's warships were among the most powerful in Europe, they still had vulnerabilities in combat. Part of the reason was that much of the French fleet was made up of galleys, low-cut ore-powered vessels that were still used in great numbers by other naval powers, particularly in the sheltered waters of the Mediterranean. It was a type of ship the English had little experience with. The problem with galleys, they are very short-range, they're not very seaworthy, uh, and they're not very well suited to the stormy seas and tide races around the shores of the British Isles. But in a dead calm or shallow water, these oar-driven vessels could swarm around sailing ships like sharks, delivering swift and deadly attacks with heavy guns mounted in their bows. Quite early in the reign of Henry VIII and his first war with France, War of 1512, the English fleet encountered French squadron of galleys from the Mediterranean. It may have been the first time that most English seamen had ever met this dangerous new thing. And the French galleys actually sank one ship outright with their heavy guns and badly damaged another. This was the kind of thing which had never happened with guns before. Most people have been brought up to regard guns as just a noisier kind of crossbow. The idea that you could actually be sunk with these heavy guns was very alarming, and it may well be that which set off in the English minds an urgent search for ways of mounting these heavy guns in big ships. Henry attacked the problem from several directions. He added new classes of fast oared vessels to his navy to form a wing of swift, highly maneuverable ships to serve as an anti-galley screen for the larger carracks like Mary Rose. <laughs> 
Henry's other warships, including the Mary Rose, entered the dark yards to be refitted and rearmed with more powerful guns. A 16th century document known as the Anthony Roll depicts illustrations of Henry's ships, along with an inventory of the guns they mounted. The lists include all the guns that have been recovered from the wreckage of Mary Rose. One of the finest bronze guns we recovered is called a bastard, a demi culverin bastard. It's got very, very fine lion heads, lifting dolphins, and the entire muzzle of the gun is fluted and made almost to look like a Greek column. This period, obviously, decoration was still a very important part, and it was signifying wealth and money, as well as power and glory. But despite England's capability for producing high-powered cannon, Mary Rose still mounted a great number of smaller weapons. What we do see with the Mary Rose are very specialized guns, if you like, unlike later ships where you perhaps have a huge number of guns that are identical in caliber and also in their ballistic performance. Within the Mary Rose you have a hodgepodge of different types of guns. This is an anti-personnel weapon, probably for fairly close quarter engagement, and when we radiographed one of the four originals, it was found loaded with iron dice, so it would have been a pretty nasty anti-personnel device. So the only ones identified in the world as far as we know, and the first attempt at mass production of cast iron artillery. As Henry VIII's reign edged toward mid-century, relations with the Catholic superpowers of Europe steadily deteriorated. Due to his divorce from his Catholic first queen, Catherine of Aragon, his subsequent break with the Roman Church, and his creation of the Church of England. Between the 1513 war against the French and the 1545 war, of course, uh, fundamental changes had occurred uh, in England. We'd had the Reformation, we'd had the transfer of nearly a third of national wealth in the form of the monasteries and church lands into Henry's own hands. He was also aware that uh, having been excommunicated by the Pope, the two leading military superpowers uh, of Europe, France and the Spanish Empire, would want to come at some stage and sort him out. By mid-July 1545, France had assembled a huge fleet of 235 warships to mount an invasion of England. Portsmouth Harbour, a primary anchorage of the Royal Navy, was the only logical target for the invasion. After several attempted preemptive strikes against the French fleet met with failure, the royal fleet of 64 ships assembled in Portsmouth to wait for the inevitable battle. July 18th, 1545. The French fleet anchors in St. Helens Roads on the northeast corner of the Isle of Wight. At dawn the next day, the French galleys begin rowing into the channel toward Portsmouth Harbor. The air is still. The English ships, with no wind in their sails, are unable to move into firing position. It is every English sailor's worst nightmare. Henry VIII, viewing from above in nearby South Sea Castle, watches as his favorite ship, Mary Rose, and the rest of his fleet lie defenseless, facing certain destruction from the advancing French galleys. As the shots begin falling all around them, there's nothing the English can do but pray for the wind to blow. The battle off Portsmouth on July 19, 1545, began disastrously for the English. For over an hour, the guns of the French galleys inched toward the becalmed English carracks. Then, the wind suddenly began to rise. The English ships sailed out of the anchorage, firing their cannon. Mary Rose, following behind the Great Harry, fired off her starboard broadside. She began turning to fire the guns on her port side. And then the unthinkable happened. The Mary Rose, Henry VIII's pride and joy and technological wonder, heeled over and sank with nearly 600 crewmen. The tragic loss occurred in full view of the king and his company, the Rose now resting on the muddy bottom just beyond today's Spitzand Fort. It seems quite probable that the Mary Rose went down because she was trying to tack to fire the guns on the other side. The gun ports were certainly very near the water. Uh, it would have needed smart, well-organized ship's company to shut the gun ports on one side, tack the ship, open the gun ports on the other side. She was crowded with soldiers because they were still expecting a hand-to-hand -hand battle, and uh, it looks as though there was something like chaos on board. Despite the loss of Mary Rose, 
the heavy cannonades of the surviving English ships turned the tide of battle, battering the more lightly armed French galleys into retreat. Attempts to raise the Mary Rose were launched within days of the battle. They were unsuccessful, however, and the wreck settled in the mud and remained there until a location was rediscovered in the 1970s. Henry VIII died in 1547, just six months after making peace with France. In the English dynastic disputes that followed, Henry's navy was neglected and starved of funds. By the time his youngest daughter Elizabeth was crowned queen in 1558, the fleet had seriously shrunk in size compared to Henry's reign. But the new queen was especially involved in both military and business dealings with the private ship owners and sea captains of Plymouth. Though still relying on their ships to defend England, she also gave them permission to engage in an activity known as privateering, which was really a form of legalized piracy. In the mid 16th century, the English learned a style of, of private war directed mainly against the Spanish and Portuguese empires. Um, which combined what we would call piracy with a certain amount of illegal trade in waters which the Spaniards regarded as a monopoly that foreigners were excluded from. And typical of the age, of course, are this narrow, interrelated group of gentry and younger sons of gentry who operate out of Plymouth and Devon and the West Country, who make a formidable international trade of preying on Spain's mercantile commerce to the Americas. These are the guys who are conversely pirates, traders, slave traders, whatever. They are entrepreneurs on the threshold of the modern world who are taking every economic opportunity they can. King Philip II of Spain ruled over a vast empire of burgeoning wealth and power, sharing with Portugal a commanding lead in navigation, exploration, and plunder of the New World. To the merchant adventurers of Plymouth, selling slaves to eager buyers in Spanish colonial outposts in the Americas was akin to looting the treasure convoy sailing back to Spain. Just another opportunity to acquire riches at the expense of a hostile and, in their eyes, arrogant Spanish empire. Slaves were looked upon as commodities, and again, in the atmosphere of the time, this was seen to be acceptable. But slaves are very much a very strong economic part of the development of our country at that time, with great places like Liverpool and Bristol developing through the slave trade. A blot on our past, I think, but something again which was very much prevalent in that period of history. John Hawkins was one of the most successful privateers in Plymouth. The most prominent of them all were the Hawkins family of Plymouth. Uh, they are engaged in a number of uh, English enterprises in which they were more or less the first English ship owners, shipmasters, to try pushing into really long distance trades and also, more or less as an automatic consequence, to push into the monopolies claimed by Spain and Portugal. To King Philip II, Hawkins was trouble enough, but increasingly it was Hawkins' young cousin and protege, Francis Drake, who acquired the more fearsome reputation. Because of his uncanny gifts of navigation, the fierce loyalty of his crews, and his astonishing success as a privateer, Drake was known to Spanish sailors as El Draco, the dragon, and imbued him with almost supernatural powers. He was a great seaman, arrogant, great sort of charisma, overpowering in many ways, and my goodness, wasn't he tough? He was tough on people who stood against him. The profits reaped by sea captains like Drake and Hawkins on their privateering ventures made them wealthy. These profits were also distributed among the crews, their investors, and the crown. Often, one of the investors was Queen Elizabeth herself. They're going out there to make a profit. And it's very interesting to see the queen herself then coming in on this trade and investing in people like Drake and Hawkins and saying, yes, I want a piece of this action and uh, I will finance you in this. Privateering was by now an established form of revenue for the Crown. It was also a form of undeclared war. It was for both these reasons that Elizabeth sanctioned a venture by Drake in late 1577. He was planning to raid the Spanish ports and Spanish shipping on the west coast of South America, and then to proceed on into the Pacific Northwest, 
it's surprisingly difficult to be sure to what extent people like Sir Francis Drake were acting explicitly under orders from the Queen or with a discreet wink and a nod or were stretching their discreet wink and a nod in ways which had not been intended. It's in the nature of 16th century warfare and obviously a complete lack of communications with people once they're at sea. You have to leave them a lot of room to play with and people like Drake were apt to do a lot of playing when they had a lot of room to play with. The Queen would have to cope with the consequences, but th that was in the nature of the world. In the days before radio, you couldn't help it. Setting sail from Plymouth in his swift and nimble flagship, the Pelican, Drake made his way across the South Atlantic and routed Cape Horn at the tip of South America. The Pelican was very similar to a new generation of smaller, faster galleons that had come to be known as race-built galleons. They were in part influenced by Drake and Hawkins' battle experience against the larger Spanish galleons during their raiding ventures. They found that the best way to counter the towering Spaniards was by using speed and maneuverability to stay away from the enemy, where they could safely pound them with their longer-range cannon called culverins. One of the key figures in designing this new breed of warships was Matthew Baker. As master shipwright during much of Queen Elizabeth's reign, Baker was instrumental in establishing the specifications for the race-built galleons. Some of Baker's pioneering plans survive in a book residing in the Pepys Library at Cambridge University. The Matthew Baker book is of enormous significance because it is the first record that we have in the whole of Europe of designing from plans. Unlike earlier shipwrights, who design by experience, instinct, and by building scale models of their ships, which guided workmen during their construction, Baker used designs drawn out on paper, many of which were inspired by the forms of swift moving fish. Drake's ship possessed many of the attributes of these new vessels, and as he sailed into the Pacific, anticipating success, he renamed his ship the Golden Hind. Just a few days later, off the coast of Peru, he spotted the Spanish treasure galleon, Senora de la Concepcion. Despite her heavy armament, Drake attacked in the much smaller Golden Hind, overwhelming the Spanish crew with the sheer surprise and fury of the assault. Once aboard the Senora, the loot Drake and his men found exceeded their wildest expectations jewels, uncut stones, nearly 80 pounds of gold, and an incredible 26 tons of silver. It was one of the greatest hauls of all time, a treasure worth more than Queen Elizabeth's total revenue for an entire year. After exploring the North Pacific coast of present-day Canada, which he scoured for signs of a Northwest Passage, and reportedly going ashore near present-day San Francisco, Drake sailed across the Pacific he landed back at Plymouth in the fall of 1580, having circumnavigated the world, the first such voyage since Magellan. Besides being enraged at the egregious plundering of his ships and settlements, Spain's King Philip II was stunned that the historic voyage had been made by a mere Englishman. Drake, of course, is only the second person to take a ship all the way around the world. It's as though, you know, the United States puts the first man on the moon and then ten years later the second man in the moon is put there by Luxembourg or something. It's, it was an extraordinary upset. Queen Elizabeth knighted Drake for his extraordinary achievement and reveled in her fantastic share of the Spanish booty. Now an extremely wealthy man, Drake eventually made the magnificent Buckland Abbey his home. But King Philip was not about to let Drake's insults go unavenged. He soon began planning a campaign that the Spaniards called the English Enterprise. During its course, the towering galleons of his most Catholic majesty would clash with Elizabeth's race-built galleons in one of the most famous battles in history. The outcome would decide the fate of the English nation. In the summer of 1588, with the growing threat of a hostile Spanish force, England's dockyards were heavily engaged in new shipbuilding and armament. Chatham was at the center of these preparations. Its chief attraction in earlier times was the good clay soil along the River Medway, 
where temporary dry docks were dug out of the mud banks for building and repairing ships. Like the other royal dockyards, Chatham had grown into a virtual city of craftsmen and laborers. Now, in this fateful summer, all of England was alive with activity. The militias were armed, the whole country bracing for invasion. Everybody in England believed that this was finally the time when Catholic Europe was going to take its revenge on the Protestant island. And there's no doubt that here was a nation embattled. And here was a nation that would stand on its principles, it would stand on its fighting power, and it would stand on what was by now its Protestant heritage. To punish England, Philip assembled an armada of 200 ships at Cadiz and a huge land army in Flanders, which the armada would embark across the channel to invade England. In April of the previous year, Sir Francis Drake led a bold preemptive strike on the Spanish anchorage at Cadiz. The surprise attack was a huge success. All the important Spanish ships in Cadiz were either destroyed or crippled and plundered, giving the English a few more critical months to prepare their defenses. By July 18, 1588, the English battle fleet was assembled at Plymouth with the Western squadrons under Drake being joined by the squadrons from Chatham, commanded by England's Lord Admiral, Lord Howard of Effingham. On the night of July 19th, all the coastal warning beacons were lit. The Armada had been sighted off the Sillies in the southwest of Plymouth. There arose a legend that Sir Francis was so unconcerned about the Spaniards' approach that he calmly continued with his game of bowls in the greens of the Plymouth Hoe. If the story about Drake is true, I think you would have to see it as a kind of public relations gesture, which in fact was something Drake was good at. He was almost certainly much too busy at this point, desperately collecting his men and his stores and his ships and so on, for them to sail in, a, in two or three hours to have had time to be playing bowls. The Armada had gotten off to a rocky start, battered by Atlantic gales as it approached England. From the very beginning, it seemed as though the winds and sea currents around England conspired to protect her. The Armada itself brought up channel out of its own operating area, uh, comprising largely transports built for ocean going, suddenly find themselves in an environment where there's shallows, there's currents, there's tides, uh, and all the sort of things that don't actually play to its advantages. As the Spaniards entered the English Channel, sailing in a rigid crescent formation, the English fleet assembling at Plymouth was just visible in the distance. It would have seemed an ideal moment for the Spanish to attack. But the Armada's commander, the Duke of Medina Sidonia, was under strict orders to sail on to Calais. Off Calais, the Armada was to rendezvous with the Duke of Parma, the commander of the Spanish army in the Netherlands. So the Armada sailed past Plymouth the English ships pursued. From the moment the drummer on Drake's flagship, the Revenge, beat the battle drum and her gunners opened fire in the first engagement, the differences between the two fleets were clear. The English raceboat galleons were much more like privateers. They were informal. The degree of royal management was extremely small and they profited by this. The fighting core of each fleet was its galleons. The Spanish galleons were tall and lumbering, crowded with soldiers for fighting across decks. But they were unable to close quarters with the faster English race-built galleons. You're confronted basically by fast-moving, maneuverable, heavily gunned English warships. They were nimble, they were fast. If they got into trouble with some of the big uh, Spanish ships, they moved quickly away, they come back in again. And these big lumbering transports and Atlantic ships were not able to cope in the channel with these very maneuverable English ships. Using their long range culverins mounted in strong naval carriages, the English gunners were better trained and better equipped than the Spaniards. You'll find that the Spanish and Portuguese ships had a rate of fire that was at least uh, two thirds less. Uh, than its opponents. The weight of shot, similarly. There were skirmishes on the first day off Plymouth, 
The third day along the Devon coast, Portlandville, the Isle of Wight, and on toward Calais. But few casualties were inflicted in the long range cannonade, and the Armada sailed on, never breaking its disciplined formation. After a day long battle off Calais, the fleets retired for the night. The English to take on provisions from supply ships from Chatham, and the Spanish to wait for Parma's army to arrive. The English, in many respects, were badly worried. And of course, the main Spanish army, by far the most powerful army in the world, under the Duke of Parma, was sitting there in Flanders. And what the English feared and the Spaniards hoped was that the Armada would now take the Duke of Parma's army across to land in England. That very day, July 27, 1588, Queen Elizabeth rode to Tilbury on the English coast to inspect her troops and rouse her people for the invasion she felt was surely imminent. To the anxious assembly there, she said, I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king and of a king of England too and think foul scorn that Parma or Spain or any prince of Europe should dare to invade the borders of my realm. But no matter how inspiring, it would take more than words to stop the mighty armada. Indeed, if it succeeded, the English Navy and with it, the English nation might very well cease to exist. On the fateful night of July 27, 1588, the commander of the Spanish Armada waited anxiously off Calais. What he didn't know was that the Duke of Parma had given up on Philip's plan of invading England for fear of attack from Dutch Protestant rebels. In the pre-dawn darkness of the following day, all these problems became moot with the appearance of a group of ships which had been purposely set afire and to drift into the anchored Spanish warships. The fire ship attack was Drake's idea his strategy was to strike the Spaniards so quickly that they would be unable to form any coherent units. The Spanish captains hurriedly cut their cables to get underway and avoid the fire ships. Confusion reigned as collisions occurred, men panicked, and Medina Sidonia's rigid control over his fleet disintegrated. They fight a major battle, which is usually called the Battle of Graveline, but they get close enough to fire their heavy guns well within the range of pistols near enough for people to be shouting at one another. Uh, two or three of the Spanish ships were actually sunk. Uh, quite a lot of others we know were badly damaged. The Spanish fleet is also very nearly completely wrecked on the Flanders banks. Even as the battle moved north, so did the wind, which made only one course open to Medina Sidonia to take his fleet into the North Sea. The English broke off their pursuit at the Firth of Forth leaving the Armada to be battered by the autumn gales of the North Atlantic. Eventually, 67 Spanish ships out of 200 would finally stagger home, many of the crews dead or dying. The final death toll was as high as a third of the original complement. After the battle, silver coins were issued in England and the Netherlands with the Latin inscription, Flavit Deus et Dissipate Sunt. God breathed, and they were scattered. It typifies the Englishman's attitude at the time is that God was an Englishman. And certainly after the Reformation, uh, that was the Protestant view, is that not only had the valor of English seamen and soldiers saved them from the Armada, but God himself had personally intervened and uh, scattered the Armada. The Armada had given the nation confidence at sea. It had taken on a superpower and effectively beaten them. With the defeat of Spain, England had proved that the sea was, as Shakespeare put it, her moat defensive, and the Royal Navy was both her shield and sword. England was not just a maritime nation, but a sea power poised to take an ever greater role in world events. Sir Francis Drake only survived the Armada's defeat by seven years. He died of a fever during an ill-fated raid against Spanish settlements in South America in 1595. But his spirit lives on in the storied traditions of the Royal Navy, which are carefully nurtured and preserved at places like Devonport Naval Base at Plymouth. In the great dining hall 
Officers, young and old, are surrounded by reminders of Drake's achievements. From the ship models commemorating the 400th anniversary of the Armada's defeat, to what is believed to be the very sword Drake carried. It was in Plymouth that Drake began and ended his epic circumnavigation, and where his statue still stands, proudly overlooking the harbor where he helped lead the English fleet out into the channel to decide the fate of his nation. Building on the spirit of those giants of the 16th century like Sir Francis Drake, the Royal Navy evolved into a mighty force that would propel England to the pinnacle of empire in the centuries ahead. This was the great sort of uh, Elizabethan period, the 16th century, which really saw not only the establishment of the Royal Navy as a proper force, but also the beginnings of empire for the British. Of course, that period spawned this wonderful group of people, Drake, Hawkins, Raleigh, Grenville. And of course, the Spaniards for many years after his death described, you know, Drake as the worst pirate of all time. But he was a man of his time, great entrepreneur, great businessman, great leader, and what a tough man to achieve the things he did. But a wonderful group of people. I don't know if they go down too well today, but they were really men of their time. It was Drake whose fighting spirit could not have allowed the Armada to rest at anchor at Calais and was instrumental not only in Spain's defeat and humiliation, but in England's growing confidence at sea and abroad. There arose a legend that if ever England is in a time of need, Drake's drum will summon him to rescue his country again. And when England's survival is at stake, the Royal Navy will answer the call in his stead. Queen Elizabeth I built up a navy her father would have loved to have commanded. But in future, heavy armament will assume a more prominent role in fighting at sea. Fleet commanders will need bigger, stronger ships to support a greater number of heavy cannon. And the Royal Navy's answer to the problem would be to write down a fighting doctrine and issue it to all its admirals. That doctrine would result in the great ships of the line. 